Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone. So, um, as well, Simon said, I've been dabbling with Erlang now on and off for about uh, 17 years. And I was actually on the team who uh, worked on the first release of you know, what is today referred to as OTP. And that's what I'm, my focus is gonna be about uh, today. Because you know, I could start off you know, asking you, what is scalability? So, if you look at scalability, the whole idea of handling uh, traffic spikes, you know, be able to, you know, the ability to behave in a predictable way under extremely heavy load, and also ensuring that you're able to carry the traffic, you know, the system uh, was designed to carry in the first place. You know, what is massive concurrency? Um, I think this morning they were talking about uh, telephony, but you know, try to picture you know, SMS voting. And you know, each SMS coming in gets handled in parallel. Uh, you, you, know, you want these requests to run independently of each other, and you want mil millions of simultaneous requests to go through the system. All of these requests may be interacting with each other, but most of the time running independently. You know, high availability. What is high availability? Well, you want to make sure you've got no single points of failure. You know, if you go in and you ask Joe Armstrong, he'll say, uh, you need two computers. Um, even Robert Verding, for that matter. If you go in and ask Leslie Lamport, he'll say you need three computers. Either way, you need more than one. You need redundant networks. Uh, you don't want uh, the excuse that the system administrator tripped on the network cable and caused the outage. Happens too often. You need back ba battery backups. You need you know, reserve generators. You need to cater for hardware failures. And you know, with two or more computers, you also need to distribute your software and you need to distribute your data. Point here, it's not just about software. Software, however, is an important part. And you're ensuring there is no single point of failure, your software becomes even more complex. You know, what is fault tolerance? What's the definition of fault tolerance? Well, it's the ability to continue functioning even though you've had, uh, even though things go wrong. You still want to continue working. You need to have, be able to isolate error and regain control over what's going wrong. And you know, finally, distribution transparency. You, you, you know, today, you're actually scaling horizontally. You know, gone are the days where you would just buy a faster computer. You add more and more hardware. And so you, what you do is you want a language with built-in distribution. And well, I couldn't find a picture of distribution, so I put in Steve Ballmer instead. I mean, he's a bit all over the place anyhow, so I thought he would do. But yeah, so y you're getting the point. I'm saying, yeah, yes, please, yes, please. And you know, what he's saying, uh, Francesco's saying, yes, yes, go in and use Erlang, of course. You know, he's been dabbling with it for so long. Erlang comes to the rescue. Erlang has a lot of great features, which a lot of you have heard about, and uh, which we've talked about. But I'm not here to talk about Erlang. Um, you know, when you're writing a massively you know, complex distributed software real time system which never goes down, you need more than just a language. Um, Erlang is just a programming language. What you do need is, you, know, you, you need architectural patterns. You need to start thinking in terms of how do you distribute your system. Now, if you think of it, you know, Erlang has solved a lot of software related problems. You've got software upgrade during runtime. You've got really good error handling primitives and message passing primitives. But when you're dealing with complex systems, a lot of the problems which you, know, you have to solve on top of the programming language you know, tend to be the same. And OTP came about ensuring that you don't go around and have to reinvent the wheel when resolving this problem. Uh, deployment will be the same. Monitoring tools will be the same. The libraries you need will be the same. So you know, this is when OTP came about. And it came about very, very early on. Uh, today, I was about you know, to start jumping up and down and saying, no, you're wrong when Joe said nothing happened between 1992 and 1995. In fact, you know, two very important things happened in those years. The first is 1992 with Erlang, the first commercial project was started, was the mobility server. And in parallel with the project, you know, they realized very, very early on that you needed more than just a programming language to solve the type of problems they were solving, that you needed middleware. And so in parallel with the mobility server, they started a project called the Basic Operating System, BOSS. And this project got merged with Erlang, with the Erlang team, and became what is today known as OTP. And you know, if we look at it today, when we say, you know, when we talk about you know, the whole Erlang development environment, 
we say earning is maybe just a third of the power you get from using it. The other third comes from the virtual machine, which is you know, highly optimized for massive concurrency, and a lot of work is going in today to make it scale on multi-core. And the other third is OTP, it's the middleware. What does OTP stand for? Does anyone know? I, 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 I'd, I'd rather not tell you. Um, you know, it could be, you know, it could stand for on the phone or one true pair or, oh, this is perfect, someone suggested uh, last week. Uh, unfortunately, you know, OTP stands for the Open Telecom Platform and it got named in the mid-90s when Erlang was not open source and you know, Ericsson was doing telecoms. So, what, you know, it, when it was named, openness was a huge theme within Ericsson. Everything had to be open. You had open systems and open network. No one really knew what this openness mean, meant. Uh, you'd walk down the corridors at Ericsson and the Ministry of Propaganda had asked a lot of posters to be printed, just like this one, of open fields. And you know, they were promoting openness. Uh, we, we had to you know, try to figure out what does openness mean today or how can we explain it. And well, today we said that openness refers you know, to the ability to interface towards other systems, so JSON, you know, XML, ASN1, SNMP, and ports. T, the T stands for telecom. Well, we yet another very unfortunate name. Uh, telecom, well, what we tend to explain that with is, you know, it, it, Telecoms uh, properties are distributed, massively concurrent, soft real-time with requirements on scalability and high availability. And then the third word, uh, platform, I think is probably the real term, the only real term which describes OTP. So very unfortunate name and uh, that we noticed in 2000, I was doing my first job outside of Ericsson uh, consulting and I'd, I was working with a company working on uh, the Jabber protocol, XMPP, and you know, they'd done a proxy which was really, well, which was there to make an existing um, XMPP stack scale. And my first you know, reaction is that they've done everything in Erlang. And why haven't you used gen servers? Why haven't you used behaviors? You know, or stating it, why haven't you used ODP? And their reaction there was, we're doing instant messaging systems. We're not doing telecom systems. So we didn't even look at it. And that's why today you'll find most people refer to it as OTP and try to tone down the telecom part as much as possible. So l let's dig a bit deeper into OTP. So first of all, it's, it's a middleware. You know, what do we mean by middlewares? Now, by middleware, think in terms of a set of abstract principles and design rules. I think Jonas Bonner earlier when he explained ACA did a great job digging into the principles of ACA. Erlang and OTP have a very set of, similar set of principles. What OTP does, it describes the architecture of a system. And it describes certain rules you have to follow. And these rules are there because all of the existing tools expect these things to be in place, allowing these tools to be compatible with what you're doing. Not only, it goes in and actually greatly in, uh, simplifies the understanding of the, of the system among teams. So in fact, you know, if you look at an architecture of an Erlang system you know, written by Ericsson, and you look at an architecture of an Erlang system written by some, any other company, Basho or Nortel, well, rest in peace, Nortel's not around anymore, but t take, any other, take any other company within the telco space, there are quite a few using Erlang. The architectures will be very, very similar. And the things these, two, these systems do in common will be the same. So someone going in trying to understand the system, doesn't, they don't have to go in and understand the client server setup. All they need to see is, ah, this is a, an existing client server setup. What they need to then focus is on what the server actually does. So it's a layer of abstraction. And it's once again the concepts, you know, while systems do very different things, they will do a lot of things in the same way, in the same manner. And what they have is, you know, if we look at design patterns, what they've done is they've abstracted a set of behaviors. And each behavior is a framework for generic code. And if you think of Erlang processes, you'll have to start them, you have to stop them, uh, you have to monitor them, you need to send messages to them, you need to receive replies, and you need to, well, terminate or kill them or, or, or clean them up. And what they do is, you know, you, you get a set of library models, which I'm gonna go into more detail later, which will do all of these things in a very uniform way. If we look at libraries, there are lots of libraries uh, you've got, uh, which come as part of the standard Erlang distribution. 
You've got basic applications. Uh, they'll include the runtime system, compiler, the standard libraries. You've got database applications. Uh, as part of OTP came Nisia. Nisia was a production-ready database in 1995. It was being used to distribute data and run transactions across nodes. When it was released as open source in 98, there was no other database available uh, on the market which did what Nisia was doing. Uh, you've got um, you know, a lot of operation and maintenance applications. So, you know, looking at monitoring, uh, looking at SNMP, OTP, MIBS, and there's also a lot on interfacing and communicating uh, with the outside world. Uh, and here we're looking at TCP IP based uh, protocols, so TCP, UDP, HTTP, FTP. We are looking at interfacing other languages, um, you know, Java interface, C, um, XML parsing, Corba. I, I, I could go on and on, but it's, it's there. You know, usually, you, know, you tend to see Erlang, an OTP, and an Erlang system as the glue, gluing together a lot of different systems. So this openness is there, and it's, well, it's true today. So you know, it wasn't certainly true in 1995 when OTP first came out. It was everything but open but openness has been added as we've gone along. A lot of tools, uh, tools for testing. Uh, you've got uh, unit testing, you've got common tests. There are no mocking frameworks as part of OTP itself, but a lot available as open source. You've got release tools, upgrade tools. You know, we like, you know, we are language like to go out and make it appear like your know, software upgrade during runtime is easy. Uh, it is not. You've got, um, you've got hundreds of processes running and you're doing non-backward compatible changes, you're doing schema changes, you're doing you know, changes to the protocol, to the logic, and all of this in a distributed environment. You can't just load in a new module and, hey, guess what, we're running a new module all of a sudden and you know, all the bugs are gone. You need to go in and you need to control and monitor and distribute all of the load mechanisms. So there are tools to handle all the release handling. Um, something goes wrong and most of the time, you know, when Erlang systems when things do go wrong in Erlang systems, it's during an upgrade, you've got the ability to fall back you know, to what, to the state you were in prior to the upgrade. Um, there are tools you know, to monitor concurrency, um, to monitor well, the operating system, and so on and so on. So, what is, what is the point with OTP? Well, first of all, you get much less code. There was a study which was made where they went in and rewrote um, some C++ applications which had been deployed at Motorola into Erlang. Uh, they were emergency communication systems. And the result was, you know, they went in and re-implemented them, uh, tested them, and went in and counted every single line of code on the C++ side and on the Erlang side. And the conclusion was that depending on how you counted, you got four to 20 times less code than your C++ application. And the 20 times came about when you actually assumed that OTP was part of Erlang and part of the runtime system and part of the libraries. You know, the C++ project was very successful, but they had to go in and reinvent their own OTP. And that's something all the C++ projects I've seen which have been highly successful, these generic frameworks had to be implemented on a by company by company basis. So you know, that means you know, much less code. Um, all of the generic patterns are there and taken care of. Less bugs, it's a solid, well-tested system. Programmers just have to think about the specifics of what their system is doing. All of the generic behaviors and all of the tricky borderline situation are usually handled. Much more solid code and tested code, and obviously more free time. We usually say, you know, airline developers like drinking beer, OTP frees them up and gives them more time over for beer drinking. There are two cons, though, uh, to it. First of all, there's a much steeper learning curve. And you know, that certainly was the case. If you go back 10 years, things are getting much better now uh, with much better documentation. And the second is you know, there will be a slight, uh, your, your um, performance will be slightly affecting as you're adding a few more layers. Minimum, you know, it's, it's not a problem. What you're doing is you're look, not trying, you, you wouldn't pick Erlang to write fast programs. You pick Erlang to make sure that your programs are fast enough and ensure that they never go down. So the performance isn't that much of an issue. Now, I'll give you some examples with, with uh, you know, where OTP comes into the picture and how you actually have to apply a certain philosophy when dealing with it. Now, first of all is the whole idea of failing safe, fail safe, and fail early. What you want is you want to hide 
you know, when, you, when we're talking about fail safe, we want to hide the tricky parts and all of the error handling from the programmer. So if there are special issues, so let, let me just give an example in Erlang to explain my point. So one of the things you're not encouraged to do in Erlang is defensive programming. So assume you have to go in and uh, convert a day from a day to a week. This is the function convert, and we're passing in an atom. An atom could be the value from Monday to Sunday. We return a number. Now, we shouldn't be calling this function with any other value. Now, someone coming from uh, a C background or someone who's used to defensive programming would automatically go in and add a catch-all clause returning error unknown day uh, to their code. And that means that every time we're actually calling convert, we need to make sure that either we return an integer or check for an error. Matter of the fact is people won't go in and check for errors. Uh, there was a case where I was getting a runtime error. I was expecting an in, I was doing, doing, doing a lookup in a database. I was expecting a runtime error, and I got a runtime error because I got an error unknown message, which had been stored in the database. And I went in and tried to figure out, okay, who's writing this error unknown message in the database? Went in and looked. There were a hundred different places in that code where we were actually inserting data into the database. So I went in and grepped in two million lines of code for the error unknown message and actually went in and found it, and found that error. And it was when data was coming in from an external device driver into the system, uh, by mistake, uh, they'd put in the wrong version of the firmware. They, hadn't, they weren't checking the version on the Erlang side. And so they got a message which they didn't realize. And instead of rejecting it there and then, they actually went in and stored the error in the database. What they should have done is gone in and actually made the program terminate, make the, make the program crash. So you go in and you try to convert a day, the day doesn't exist, none of the clauses match, the program, the process would have automatically terminated. And you know, the last thing you wanna do is have developers go in and try to handle specific error cases. When they do, they'll actually end up inserting even more bugs in the system than these borderline error cases they believe they handle. And, you know, and that's the whole idea you know, when dealing with airline, dealing with OTP. You want to go in and isolate the error. You want to make, you know, generate a runtime error, catch it early. The fact that you have no shared memory means that you'll most probably not corrupt any data around it. And just the only thing you need to keep in mind is dependencies. How do we handle it? Now, if you think, you know, with airline, we've got processes, and you know, processes will be linked to each other. Now assume now process A goes in and tries to, process in goes, a, goes in and tries to convert a day of the week which doesn't exist. We're not taking care of that particular case, so that process terminates. What it does is it sends an exit signal to process B, which is this link to, process B receives it, terminates it, and then propagates that exit signal onto process C. Now, in this case, you know, we've killed three mutually dependent processes. What actually happens in OTP is that a process here, PID B, will go in and trap exits. So it can monitor other processes. And when it, whenever it receives an exit signal, instead of terminating itself, what it does, it receives the exit signal and it can then go in and decide how to handle that termination. So you know, assume that process was you know, dealing with an SMS. We received an SMS, we tried to go in and uh, translate it and you know, realize that, okay, we forgot to encode the euro symbol. The process would terminate, it would send an exit message to B, and the process B would decide, oh, okay, this is just an SMS, we're allowed to lose the odd SMS. It's a bug, it would log the bug, it would log the termination, and it would continue running. Process B is what we refer to in these cases as a supervisor. And its job is to monitor processes and upon process termination, decide how to react. So if process well, A terminates, process B has the knowledge and knows if there's a dependency between process A and process C. Okay, so if there's a dependency between A and C, process B would terminate process C and then restart A and restart C. If there is no dependency, it would just let, you know, PID A, you know, it would restart PID A. Or if it's a transient process, you know, if it doesn't really matter if the process terminates or not, it wouldn't restart it at all. So all of the error handling 
and all of the logic is removed from the hands of the programmer and put in on an architectural level. And it's all isolated in how we configure the supervisors. Uh, the supervisors will go in and you know, have their children, also called workers, and children could also include other uh, processes. And we create what we call a supervision tree. The supervision trees are then packed in into what we call an application. And an application is your basic building block of an Erlang system. And your typical Erlang system uh, will then consist of a set of loosely coupled applications. So all of these applications which loosely interact with each other. You'll have the Erlang runtime system, the kernel and the system architecture support library and the standard library. These are the basic, your minimal Erlang system will have to consist of these applications. On top of that, you can have other applications which come, part, uh, come as part of the OTP distribution and then the applications the developers themselves write. And the applications, you know, in these cases, you know, Mongoose IAM, Foldsome, Lager, you know, they're all open source applications which have then all been glued together by this infrastructure. All of these different applications will behave in exactly the same way. So the runtime system will not differentiate from applications which are part of OTP and applications which the developer himself has built. And releases, you know, they get started, stopped, and handled as one. And every release, every airline node will consist of one release. They can be upgraded and downgraded as a unit, and, um, you know, and, and they become very, very flexible um, as a whole. So let, let's dig down a bit more into behaviors. So looking at the workers, the, the processes themselves, the whole principle which has been applied to OTP is to take the code and break the code base into two separate parts. So think of a client-server application. What, what, what they've done is they've taken all the generic code in a client-server application, so the code which will be the same from one implementation to the other, and they've put it into the green module. All of the specifics has been put into the red callback module. And the callback module is actually what's implemented by a programmer the generic behavior comes as part of a library module. And the library behavior modules which exist in OTP today include servers, they'll include finite state machines, event handlers, supervisors, and the way we will package them in as applications. So a client server application, you know, in you know, handling SMSs will have exactly, you know, will have the same generic behavior module as a client server um, dealing with, you know, setting up calls, for example. In the generic side, you know, all of the message passing will be included there. Uh, all, of this, you know, all of the receiving messages, sending responses will, is all included in there. And you know, what we specific and what, what's in the callback module is the server state and manipulating the server state. Manipulating uh, the requests themselves. So if you send a request you know, to send an SMS, that's actually handled in the specifics. And What's also handled in the generic, what gets hidden in the generic, are all of the tricky parts of concurrency. And when Yunus was speaking of Akka and I'm you know, here speaking of Erlang, you know, what we do not mention is that, well, there are a lot of horrors when you're dealing with concurrent programming. You've got race conditions, you've got deadlocks, uh, you've got mutexes, mutexes and so on. And you know, I'll, I'll give you a few examples in the code. You assume we've got a client here sending a message to the server. Up there we've got a message of the format request PID message. The server receives the message and it decides to send back, it handles the message and sends back a reply using the reply function right here. The protocol is a tuple of the format request, which is just an identifier, an atom. The PID, which is the identifier of the client, and then the message itself, which gets handled by the server. We send back a reply where we've got the control atom reply and the reply itself. And you know, most programmers, most 9 to 5 programmers will probably go in and code you know, the, the message passing this way. Now you go in and you add a second server, which all of a sudden goes in and sends a message of exactly the same format, of the format reply comma reply. All of a sudden the client which has sent a message to the server receives back a reply, but the reply is not from the server itself, but it's from another process. And it's got no way of differentiating it. You know, most 9 to 5 programs would pro wouldn't probably think about this happening. In OTP, it's handled behind the scenes. And what they've done is they've gone in and they've added a unique reference. 
and make ref here is a built-in function which will return a unique identifier. This unique identifier is added as part of the message and it gets sent to the server. And when the server replies, it will include that reference in the message which then gets matched in the response. So we know that when we send a message, the response we get back will include that unique reference. We know that it's actually a response to the request we sent and not another request which follows the same uh, protocol. You following me here? Yeah. So that's you know, one of the many things which ODP handles. Another, you know, another example is you know, what happens if we go in and we send a message to a process and that process terminates. So what, what would be happening is we send a message to PID B, PID B terminates. You know, PID, PID A is stuck in a receive statement waiting for a response. Or we could have sent a message to PID B, but PID B has already terminated. Either or. OTP handles that behind the scenes as well. It's, it's one of the other things which you know, your typical nine to five programmer won't think about. What we do is we add a monitor. So we call Erlang monitor. A monitor is similar to a link. It's unidirectional. It will go in and it will actually you know, look at the link, look at the process. And if something happens to the process, so either, either the process is not there, what we call a uh, monitor, or the process terminates, we get a down message with you know, the unique reference. We get told that it's a process which has terminated. And we get the name of the process and the reason and we just return an error. If we get back a reply, on the other hand, we just call airline demonitor. And we basically stop monitoring the system. Do you think, is it it? Is that it? Or are there other race conditions you can think of? There's one more race condition. What happens if PID A sends a message to PID B? PID B sends a response, then someone else sends a message to PID B. PID B terminates and sends us a down message before PID A is able to read the response. Wouldn't be that much of a deal other than, you know, we'd go in, we'd get the reply message, and we'd send back the reply, but we would then also receive a down message which would then be stuck in our mailbox. So we'd get a little memory leak, and this memory leak would continue for every time something like this would happen. It was a similar bug I came across when I wasn't using ODP, where every time I was closing a port, I'd get an exit message from the port. Next thing I knew, there were two, 3,000 messages in the mailbox, and you know, the machine was running at 100% CPU. So another thing one needs to do is, you know, airline demonitor with the reference, and what we do is we flush. So in case there are any down messages when we call demonitor, we make sure we get rid of them. So, you know, these, you know, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. Many, many more things can actually go wrong when you're dealing with concurrency. Um, you know, there are timeouts, you can have deadlocks. All of this is handled behind the scenes with an OTP. So you know, you, your 9 to 5 programmer just using a behavior gets all of this without having to worry, without having to think about it at all. And yeah, so other things you get through behaviors are you know, tracing, you've got built-in tracing, you've got monitoring, and you have distribution as well. Distribution, you know, there's a very, very simple distribution layer which allows you to distribute applications across nodes. And your distribution is very simple. What you have is assume we've got three airline nodes and we go in and we configure that we want my application to primarily run on node one, but if node one goes down, we want it to run either on node two or node three. So through a simple configuration, uh, my app starts running on node one, and node one dies. What happens is we wait two seconds, which is configured up here, 2,000 milliseconds, and if node one doesn't come back up, we restart the application on node two. And this is what we refer to as a failover. Node two terminates, and we wait two seconds, and we do a failover over to node three. What happens there is that node one then comes back up again, Node one has a higher priority than node two or node three. So the application is then migrated over to node one. And that's what we refer to as a, as a takeover. 
So you know, with one simple line, you, know, you have tools to actually go in and visualize all of this happening. You, know, you get some very, very happy managers where you're demonstrating failovers and takeovers. With, and you can go around killing nodes and then showing that your, your system's still up and running with very, very little effort. Now, OTP came about in 2000, well, 95. It was released, OTP R1 came out in 1996 as a first. And you know, the, the types of problems which were being solved in Europe were very different from the types of problems which, which were being solved in the States when Erlang started picking up in the States. We, we, we had a conference in 2009 in the States, and you had all of the Europeans going in and talking about clusters and smaller clusters and high availability. And then you had the American uh, counterparts. And it was the first time we'd ever run a conference in the States. You had the American uh, counterparts, or the, the, other, the American side of the airline community. They're all talking about massive scalability. They're all talking about cloud computing. And something hit us. We'd realized that on the West Coast in the States, they'd been solving problems of a magnitude we in Europe hadn't even dreamed of. You know, and I'm talking about the likes of Amazon, PayPal, eBay, Yahoo, who needed this massive scalability. And at that point, we felt kind of OTP was a bit behind its times. And there's a pro project called Release. And Release is a, an EU project which aims at getting Erlang to run on machines you know, with tens of thousands, even millions of cores. And very quickly, you know, just to give you, I'll say a bit about you know, machines running on multi-core, but you know, for every core you've got, the Erlang VM will run a scheduler. And, then a lot of, and, the, and it will then distribute processes into run queues. So for each scheduler, you'll have a run queue with separate processes. And I think the big effort, the, lot, the big work with the Erlang VM being done today is on the migration logic. A, a process, um, you know, a process um, exchanging messages, message, doing message passing, where a process on the same core has, has a cost associated with it. You're doing, you know, you're message passing on a separate core, but the same chipset, there's another cost associated with it. Your message passing to a process another chipset, you know, there's an even higher cost associated with it. So, a lot of the migration logic, work around migration logic, is trying to group together processes which cooperate with each other and message pass with each other. And this, the release project, it's a project funded by um, the European Union. Uh, there are about three and a half million euros which have been applied, which have been granted for this project, and it's a mixture of universities and um, companies. And the goal here, you know, if we look at limitations of Erlang today, it's on three levels. Uh, first of all, it's on the virtual machine. You know, how do you get the virtual machines to scale with tens of thousands of cores? Not only, you don't want to scale it beyond a certain number of cores. What you want to do is you want to add a distribution layer to it. And that's where the second work package as part of this release comes in standard distributed Erlang languages. And what they're looking at is trying, you know, looking at distribution models, which you know, I'm gonna go into a bit more detail later. Then on top of it, you need a scalable infrastructure. You need a way to scale up and scale down your systems dynamically as and when they happen. And then there's another work package which deals with tools. So looking at the VM, uh, the goal here is to evolve the Erlang virtual machine. There's actually a release coming of the VM. Uh, the next release of the VM will have a lot of the research and a lot of the add-ons which, have, been, which have, been come, have come as part of this process. And you know, they're visualization tools. So they're looking at tools which visualize the migration of processes from one runtime queue to another. And you know, Joe today was talking about, you know, getting Erlang to scale, you know, you were on a you know, machine with, I think, 64 cores and it was about 30 times faster. Here we're looking at probably, you know, 100, 200 cores. The second problem with Erlang is distribution. And uh, if you're looking at massive scalability, there are two things. One is you don't, you know, you'll have many VMs running next to each other. And so what you'll do is you'll be running distributed Erlang across the cores. And distributed Erlang today won't scale beyond a few hundred nodes. And the reason is that all the nodes today are fully meshed. You can create partitions, but it's very, very static. And SD Erlang is looking at creating clusters of nodes 
and then dynamically being able to size them up and size them down so that you know, your fully mesh network isn't the requirement anymore. It will group nodes and it will actually allow my process migrations from one node to another. And finally, you know, on the top layer, you need a way to actually manage all of these massive clusters. So when you're scaling horizontally, you need a middleware layer. And that's where CCL, uh, called the Sicily, comes into the picture. And that's one of the other deliverables. Uh, CCL stands for Cloud Cuckoo Land. It's just a working name. I'm sure the marketing people will figure something better out when that happens. And the whole idea is to be able to get massively distributed clusters to scale on heterogeneous networks. So you could you know, have you know, a few thousand uh, nodes running on a blue gene architecture, interacting with uh, nodes running on Amazon or Rackspace, and all man and manage these nodes in, in a complete unified way. Uh, you want to be able to monitor them and you know, control them, and that's where uh, Sicily comes into picture. Another uh, requirement is the whole idea of auto-scaling. So you'll go in, you'll monitor particular nodes, you'll monitor um, you know, CPU utilization, you'll monitor memory utilization, and you're noticing, you know, as soon as you notice if you hit certain thresholds, it will fire off and add more instances. And as soon as that's done, you know, as soon as that peak is managed, it can, could reduce the cluster and reduce the size. So Another you know, goal with Sicily is to actually be able to go in and integrate the tool with other management tools, operation and management tools, which exist today, just to make operations completely seamless. So, you know, the conclusion is, yes, you should be using Erlang, but you should be using Erlang with OTP, because, you know, that's really when, you know, when you want to make systems which are massively scalable, you need more than just a language. You need a whole framework. you have any questions? Any thoughts? Yes. 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 Okay. So what you have is you you get sup you have supervision trees where you can go in and actually state the relationship between the supervisor and the children, and the one relationship. One of the relationships is the one-for-one -one relationship. So if a child terminates, I've stopped using the word die or kills when speaking to children. And uh, it's, um, we were actually talking about you know, killing children and restarting them on, on uh, the subway in Stockholm. And uh, this poor old lady sitting next to us looked really, really shocked. I've never seen her being, look. look she looked really relieved when it was time for us to get off. Let's put it that way. So. Um, so you know, changing your term, termination slide, you've got a one, if you have a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship, if, if a child terminates, it's automatically restarted. You can have a rest for one, meaning that if a child terminates, all the children starting after him will be terminated and then restarted. And then you have a one for all. If any child terminates, they all get terminated and then they all get restarted. Yeah. And, and then from there, what, what happens is if a child terminates, the supervisor, you configure it with the maximum number of terminations allowed per second or per hour. You know, you, you just, you know, you can decide. And if a child terminates more than X number of times within a certain amount, a certain time frame, the supervisor comes to the realization and says, okay, I am not, I'm not able to solve this problem, this termination that keep on going. The supervisor itself will terminate. And it will then propagate that to the supervisor's supervisor. That will continue until you reach the top level of the supervisor in your application. That may never terminate. So if, if an exit reaches a supervisor, a top level supervisor, your whole system gets shut down and a heartbeat will notice it. It will invoke a script and there you, know, you can decide what to do. Do you just restart your system? Do you reboot your whole machine? So there's this whole strategy which is put in place uh, which, which you're able to do. Yeah. So, there were other questions you had? Yes. Uh, maybe a simple question. Yeah. You, have, you have a, a call where I'm, you have said that the, uh, the OTP would automatically supply, well, you had the problem where you had to, there were two um, servers that, that might, might produce the same message back. Yes. Right. Now, um, and it automatically generated an, um, an individual ID. 
a unique identifier, yeah, reference. So what would happen if you had, uh, you, you, that was the assumption that the second one was produced by a different uh, uh, so, process, but what would happen if you, in the same one, was it, is there only one reference for, for So a, a reference in your whole system will, will be unique, so you won't be able, you... But you suppose you had two, you had within that, you actually started, you actually sent messages to two different ones. You would have two different references. Because you, you only have the, ref, the reference seems to be yeah. so associated it, with, with, with the call, Yes. No, exactly. So every time, so the example I had is every time we sent a message, we generated a new reference. And that's the way it works behind the scenes in OTP. So actually what happens in OTP is you don't even see the message passing. That's completely hidden. The only, what you do is you call a function cast or call. Cast is asynchronous, call will be synchronous. And you know, with, the arc, with the message you want to send back and the return value of that function will be whatever message uh, the supervisor sent, uh, the, the, um, the server sent back to you. Yeah, so it, there's a complete layer of abstraction which you know, the programmer doesn't see. <coughs> yes. Yes. So, so, yeah, I mean, the state in each process will vary from what, you know, and, and it's directly dependent on what your process does. So that's specific, and you know, the only place you manipulate your state is in your callback module. So it's in the code you as a programmer write. What is generic, so, is the storing of the state in between calls. And that's managed in the, in the behavior module itself, in the library module, which comes as part of OTP. Well, I mean, So the state is lost because it's in memory. And, and exactly, and, and the real, yeah, so what I'm, yeah, and usually you know, what we say is don't focus on trying to store your state from one crash to another. What you need to do is when you restart your process, you need to recreate your state and try to recreate it from the source. So making sure that, you know, in case it was a corrupt state which caused your process to crash, when you're recreating your state, going straight to the source will hopefully remove that corruption and, and ensure that the process will then uh, run naturally and non run normally. Yeah. Yes? Yes. Yes, I mean, there, there is a need. Uh, there is a need, huge need for it um, because the Ericsson team are doing a fabulous job with Erlang, but they're focusing on the telecom needs. And what we're looking here is the needs of, you know, massive scalability needs. The needs which are being, you know, which all of our customers are seeing. No, uh, well, these needs are coming from, you know, just uh, not the telecom industry, no, but the computing industry today on, you know, implementing massively scalable uh, systems and scaling them horizontally, scaling them by adding more hardware and adding more cores. Did that answer your question? Um, these, well, the big names is, I mean, we work, you know, if you look at Erlang Solution, we've got in excess of 200 customers. A lot of these requirements which have gone in, we are, one of our work packages was, was trialing, was you know, case studies. And a lot of our customers, especially those starting Greenfield uh, productions, are write, everyone is writing a new console every time. They've got different ways of managing and monitoring their systems. They've got different ways of scaling their systems. And so you know, creating a unified approach is, is a requirement you know, which many of them have. So, so that's where they come from. Um, big names, yes, so, I mean, there are many big names waiting to start using all of this and trialing them out. And even now, even though you know, we're still very early days, the first kind of prototype of the console, I saw a demo a couple of weeks ago, we already have two, uh, well, two customers waiting to use it and waiting to try it out. So, yeah. Yes? There are open source solutions, but no, none of them are product ready. And they'll, they'll just focus on specific needs, you know, which you know, particular users had. 
And I think the real need, the, the real problem is there's no one which has actually gone in and managed in an open source way consoles to handle you know, thousands of Erlang nodes in clusters. There are deployments with thousands of Erlang nodes out there uh, handling billions of requests per day, but um, those tools you know, to manage and handle those are not open source. Also not only, but very much also depends. You know, if, if you're using uh, virtualization and you're deploying images, there are tools you know, to deploy and monitor. But we're actually seeing you know, a move away from virtualization back to you know, running on the hardware, running on proper operating systems. And all of a sudden, you cannot mix the two. So um, you know, if, if you're looking at this, you know, this console in Sicily, a lot will actually be plug-in based where you're able to plug in existing scripts which will handle a particular architecture or a particular um, you know, cloud provider or your own private clouds. And then you know, hopefully you know, more and more of these uh, plugins will be developed uh, you know, as new architectures show up. Yeah. Okay. Just want to guess the mic. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> I'm around for the rest of today, so feel free to you know, come by and chat. <laughs>